You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Today's story is about success, failure, and redemption, and what can go horribly wrong for a syndicator when the market turns. And that's what's happening right now. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. Our guest today is a 30-year veteran real estate investor. He's controlled over $285 million in real estate transactions. Mike Morosky is an entrepreneur, author, real estate trainer, public speaker, and personal coach with strong personal resilience, as you'll hear in this story, and a deep desire to help others live an extraordinary life and stay out of jail. And he's with us here today to share his riveting story. Mike, welcome to The Real Well Show. Hey, Kathy, thanks. Uh, been looking forward to this for a while. Likewise, you've got a great story and I can't wait to get to it, but let's go back to how you got started in real estate and what you were doing before that that got you into it. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been in real estate about 30 years and prior to going into real estate, I had a general contracting business and I was your typical entrepreneur. You know, I was uh, doing all the sales, all the marketing. I was doing the hiring and the firing, all the bookkeeping. And, you know, I was still in the field banging nails. And (laughs) um, I can remember distinctly waking up one morning and uh, looking at my wife at the time and going, "I'm, I'm burnt out. I can't do this anymore. And fortunately, I had someone who was knocking on my door wanting to buy my company. And so, uh, yeah, I was pretty lucky. So I sold the company and I decided to take a year off. And, you know, if you know me, I didn't really take a year off, but (laughs) I kind of tried to figure out what I was going to do. But uh, we house hacked a couple of houses. And and Kathy, this is long before it was sexy, right? So (laughs) this was, um, you know, I can still remember her screaming at me because there were nails on the floor. But, you know, I had heard Jim Rowan say years ago that success leaves clues. And um, if you followed successful people, you could ultimately cut the learning curve and be successful yourself. So while I was house hacking, of course, I met several real estate agents and met one in particular who was really successful at the time. And I went to him uh, after, you know, he wound up selling one of these uh, two flats that we flipped. And I went to him. And, and said, I was thinking about going in the real estate business. And he said, boy, I think you'd be really good at it. And I said, great. Could I come and shadow your team? And he nice. said, no, I'll do one better than that. I'll, I'll make you a cassette tape. And this is now I'm dating myself, right? Because I don't <laughs> think you could find anything to make a cassette tape on today. Yeah. Uh, but he made me this cassette tape and I listened to it over and over and over again. I just became a sponge for knowledge and, and how to do the business. And how to do the business, not from, not from how, how to do it in books, but how to do it on the street. And I followed his fundamentals and his systems. And my first nine months in the real estate business, I sold 78 houses. I built a team selling 125 homes a year. And we did that consecutively for about 12 years. Wow. 2005 rolled around and the market was starting to soften and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do at that time. Uh, I had seven people working for me and, you know, we were scaling and, and, you know, the market kind of, we had the back wind of the market against us. And uh, I decided at that point that I should go into the apartment business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't just wake up that morning and say, Hey, I'm going in the apartment business. I had thought about it for years because I had done a lot of work when I was in the construction business for a couple of Chicago syndicators. And I knew that you could marry uh, private equity with a great real estate deal, stay in the middle. And as long as everything went well, everybody made money. So in 2005, I syndicated my first apartment uh, deal. And Wow, nobody was really syndicating in 2005. Yeah. there There was still bank money then. Yeah. Um, there was, but over 30 months, we went and raised $18 million, wow. and bought $60 million worth of real estate with it, um, was about 4,000 apartments in five markets, mm-hmm. built a property management company managing 7,500 doors, and did that all in 30 months. Wow. Amazing. Good for you. Yeah. So. And then what happened? Well, um, 2008 came around. Yes, it did. <laughs> and, um, 
you know, I, I did that. It was great. You know, I really grew this business, but I grew way too fast. And I always Mm -hmm. tell people, I say, Hey, listen, don't grow fast. You know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You'll get there. Just stay focused and keep doing what you're doing. But, um, I grew way too fast. We were very unstable as a company and I'll never forget. I was having lunch one day with my CFO and he and I were, were sitting in a restaurant and the news happened to be on and they were carrying boxes by the dozens out of Lehman Brothers. Mm. And I, I looked across the table and I said, man, we're in big trouble, aren't we? And he said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be in trouble. And, and I don't know that I really understood the magnitude of that comment at that point, but I knew something was going to shift in the market. Yeah. And we all know what happened in 2008. The whole bottom fell out across the world. And I had this company that was very unstable. 38 different companies, actually, some that were very profitable, some that weren't as profitable. I nursed the company along for several months. And in uh, the beginning of 2010, I thought, well, um, you know, I had I had probably a dozen deals I should have just let go to foreclosure and some investors get hurt. But I tried to save everybody. You know, my thought was, hey, this is just a recession. Recessions typically last 17 or 18 months. Mm. It might be a 10 or 12 percent correction in the marketplace, but it'll come back. So I thought, you know what? Let me move money from profitable companies I had to non-profitable companies. Went to my accountant and went to my attorney. Both of them said it's okay to do that. Just leave a paper trail. And so I did. Uh, the problem was though that I didn't disclose it to my investors. Mm. So you, you know, as well as I do in the real estate space, especially when we're raising capital, we have to be very transparent. Yes. Um, we have to let our investors know every move that we're making. And I, because of not being transparent and for the movement of money, I, I wound up being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges. Oh. And I got sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Oh, wow. This is so important for our audience to hear because there are so many people jumping into syndications who who aren't doing it properly and yeah. don't really understand the back end of it there's there's so much that we're still learning on the we've been doing it for 13 years on the on the back end of you know just the getting the k1s out to people on time and you know the proper reporting it's there's so much to it uh, i do worry about some syndicators out there but um, in fact, I know one who just got sentenced to seven years. Really? Some, somebody that I, I was looking at property with a, a few months ago, and and uh, I did a little research, and <laughs> bam, there it was. Wow. So, But he, he was certain he hadn't done anything wrong, but it sounds very similar. Yeah. So you your, your attorney and your accountant said it was okay, but it was just that you didn't tell your, your investors that you were doing that. Yeah, it was non non disclosure, you know. And if I if I look at the mistakes I made, and um, you know, I clearly broke the law because I didn't tell my investors. If I if I would have went to my investors and said, "Hey, um, we're moving this money from here to here," and my investors said, "Yeah, that's okay. Let's try and keep it alive," it, it would have been okay. But what I always tell people is, I say, "Look, I never flew private. I didn't have a big boat. I didn't buy a fancy house. I didn't have a big car. I was, I was the neighborhood baseball coach. I was home every night for dinner. And I got ripped from that to live in a 12 by 12 room with three men I didn't know, nor did I like. One oh, what the hell happened in my life? I can't even imagine surviving that. How long were you in prison? Uh, I was gone almost eight years. Eight years. Yeah. So oh. uh, here, let me bring it into perspective. Two things happened. I went in, we were on iPhone 2. I came home, we were on iPhone 12. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a guy who came in after me and then went home before me. And uh, when he went home, he handed me a piece of paper. He said, here, get a hold of me when you come home. And I said, what's this? He goes, that's my Instagram number or my Instagram address. I said, what's Instagram? <laughs> you know? He goes, oh, you'll figure it out when you come home. <laughs> So you have no access to those things when you're there. Yeah, you don't. Um, Mm. You know, I barely had access to uh, a computer, but because I I worked in the education department and I taught classes, um, I was able to work on a computer and write, you know, write some things. So matter of fact, while I was gone, I did a lot. You know, I I was gone probably about 21 days. And uh, during that time, you know, it was like 
how am I going to get through this? I didn't, I really didn't know how I was going to get through today, much less 10 years. And uh, it was probably gone about three weeks and my wife decided she was going to divorce me. And when that happened, that just kind of really crushed me. And um, I, I, I really, at that point, was, was lost. You know, the joke in prison was, you know, take his shoelaces because we're afraid he's going to hurt himself. Mm. Um, but, you know. That's not I, such a funny joke. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Um, uh, it, so ahead. did you have children? I do. I do have children. Yeah, I have five. So yeah. you were you able to see them at all? Um, I saw for the first couple of years, um, my young kids came up to see me. I have two, I have two daughters that are 26 and 25 that I haven't talked to since I left. Um, they're just kind of, you know, mad at dad. And so it's been a tough, tough situation. Oh my gosh. But the, so how have you, how are you sitting here in front of me looking, looking great, looking healthy, I, I, I just personally can't imagine that. And it, it's terrifying for anyone who's a syndicator because it could be a, a mistake that you didn't even know you made. But of course, like, like you, I have my attorneys look at everything. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. You know, so how did you survive about, that? Yeah. So it, interesting question. And thanks for that, by the way. Um, I, it's, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of daily discipline and a lot of daily effort. Um, you know, I've walked around for six weeks you know, not knowing how I was going to get through anything. And, and I believe Kathy, we all have defining moments in our life. And, you know, we may even have multiple ones throughout our life, but what do we do with them when they show up? I, I walk into gym one day and, and I had gone from running marathons to being 35 pounds overweight. I absolutely hated myself and, and didn't know what I was going to do. <clears throat> but this guy walks up to me and he says, Hey, don't let these people beat you. All they want to do is take everything from you you've ever known. They can take your business. They can take your money. They can take your apartments. Uh, they can destroy your family. But what they can't take is who you are and what you're made of. He said, you can get all that back. You can rebuild that $100 million company you lost. He goes, all you need to do is start making changes in your life every day. And I don't know what it was, but it was like somebody flipped the switch. And my whole world changed right in that five minute conversation with this guy. He said, come to my class, start working out every day. You'll start to lose weight. You'll start feeling better. Um, and, and I don't know what it was, but I took him up on it. I started going <laughs> to class. I started working out. I started uh, feeling better. I started losing weight. Um, I, I wound up going to college. I got a bachelor's degree in theology, um, went to school for four years. I wrote two books while I was gone. One is Exit Plan. Um, behind my you did desk. all of this while you were it behind did. bars. Yeah, really? Wow. I wrote two home study courses. I wrote an ethics course. I taught real estate investing, property management and ethics in prison for six years. Um, I was on an outreach program, would go into the community, tell my story uh, to small business owners and local college students. And I wound up uh, meeting a professor from the University of Minnesota. And he and I co-authored a paper together that we had published in the Business Journal of Ethics last year. And it gets taught at the collegiate level for forensic accounting and sales and marketing classes. Um, I'm home today. I'm in the coaching and training business. I teach multifamily investors how not to make the mistakes I made <laughs> and live a balanced lifestyle. I also just was approved by the SEC or last year I got approved by the SEC to go back and sponsor deals and be an issuer of securities again. Wow. I didn't know that was possible. Yeah. So we're, uh, we just, uh, we bought a 40 unit in Tampa that we're actively raising capital on. And um, you asked the question, how did I get through it? Well, I yeah. got through it because of my faith uh, in, in, you know, Jesus. And I got through it because I stayed busy. And I continued to um, build into what I wanted to be as a future for myself. I knew I'd come home and I'd have a whiteboard that I could just wipe off and, and, and start all over again. And, and really, that's what I've done. Do you feel sometimes like these challenges were meant to be in your path, that there was a reason for it? Yeah, you know, you, maybe, maybe people have heard the saying that it didn't happen to me, but it happened for me. And, and I do believe that, 
you know, Kathy, I made some mistakes, right? And I think we all make mistakes. And, and the biggest thing I see in people today is that, you know, they let their past define their future. And, and I don't want to let my past define my future because, because we can't, you know, I think that people are trapped in prisons. I might've been behind bars. I might've been behind a wall, but I, I, you know, I think so many people are trapped in their own mind with, you know, things that go on in their life, maybe past history, could be abuse, could be addictions, whatever it may be. And people don't have to stay stuck there. They can move on and they can get out. And that's really why I tell my story and what I want people to hear. You know, yeah, I made I made these mistakes, right? I grew too fast and was very unstable as a company. I was undercapitalized. I was over leveraged. I owned $60 million of real estate at 85% loan to value. Mm. I don't know who was worse, me for taking the money or the banks for giving it to me. Uh, you know, today <laughs> it's I, happening today. People are doing that. Yeah. I know it's happening again. And I tell people today, I say, look, don't do that deal unless you're 65 to 75 percent LTV. You know, I'm with you there. I won't go over 65. And I didn't pay attention to the details. I didn't pay attention to the red flags around me. People told me, you know, that there were things going on that they didn't like that. They didn't like some of the people that were in my close circle, and and I didn't listen. I said, oh, I got this under control, and, and I didn't have anything under control. So people need to be aware of their surroundings. You know, we all put these blinders on, and, you know, they're so tight we don't see out the sides, and we need to see that peripheral vision. Oh, I feel like the opposite of Barbara Walters, where you're making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's incredible. What what a story. How would you say you have changed as a person with, through all of this? Well, if you ask my son, who's 17 today, um, what's different about his dad, uh, he will tell you that he's much more humble today. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, yeah, I made those mistakes, but there was a sense of pride and a sense of greed that was set in in my life. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I thought that, you know, Hey, I made $15 million in 30 months, you know, and I lost it all in nine seconds. <laughs> the markets crashed, you know, deval devaluation of property and, and NOI drops and lost a lease and, you know, people move out. Um, it's hard to mitigate that storm. And, um, you know, I, I'm different today because I'm more cautious. I underwrite more conservatively today. Um, you know, I stay inside my buy box. Some of my non-negotiables that I used to have are negotiable or not, or some of my negotiables that I used to have are non-negotiable today. Um, like what? What are your non-negotiables? Well, you know, I think we all need to have a buy box when we're buying, mm -hmm. you know, multifamily or any yeah. asset class, right? And right, yeah. So if and I'm stick with it. At, yeah. If I'm looking at properties that are 1990 or newer, I, I need to stay in that, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a certain uh, asset class. I need to stay in that. If I'm looking for a certain product type, I, I need to do that because I know that works, right? Mm -hmm. B-class property, garden style, two to three story unit buildings, um, you know, something that I can go in and add value, add amenities to. It, as long as I stay in that box and I underwrite conservatively and not go outside of some fundamentals, where, like, you know, don't go, don't go above 80% loan to value or 75% loan to value, you know? Make sure you raise enough capital. So there is, you know, there's those things that that we have to do to make the deal work. And especially now walking into the market we're walking into, because this is changing right before our eyes right now. And, you know, it won't be as bad as it was in 2008, but, but we're going to see some price correction here. We're going to see some devaluation, some pullback in the market. We're already seeing it. You know, I got sent two deals today from brokers that we were looking at before and the, the seller, the buyers couldn't buy the properties. They walked down. So they're back on the market. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious where you think things are headed. It, does this feel like a repeat? Does it feel different than last time? It's a different repeat. 
That's a great way to put it, actually. <laughs> a different repeat. Okay. How uh, so? Oh, I just, you know, I a, a year ago I called it, and a year ago I said, you know, I, I see shades of 2006, 2007, you know, craziness in the in the debt market, you know, crazy kinds of loans, uh, people saying, hey, you know, you can do this deal for 85 to 90 percent based on the DSR. And I and I'd look at lenders and go, why would I want to do that deal like that? Um, you know, I don't think people understand the dynamics of it. You know, we're at a place right now where interest rates are higher than cap rates. How, how do you how do you make money in that environment? Um, your, you know, your your private equity money uh, needs to be cheaper than your debt money today. And I think it's a re-education of investors and letting investors know that, hey, the, those few years that we had of 20 percent IRRs with eight or nine percent, you know, preferred returns are changing, you know, you should be happy if we can provide a six with a 10 <laughs> to 13 IRR. So yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, it comes down to education. Yeah, absolutely. Are you saying that mainly for multifamily or for a, a single family as well? Uh, you know, I, I well, single family, I think we're going to we're going to see a lot of foreclosures on the market. We already are. I'm in Chicago. And last month alone, there were 3000 new uh, Liz pendants filed. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, softening in the market. Properties are staying on the market a lot longer. Uh, the multiple bidding has slowed way down. Hey, hey, look at one thing in, in multifamily right now. Uh, day one hard earnest money is is really gone away is is starting to go away yeah. uh, so you know you start to see these changes and you know that the the environment is changing and so, it needed to i mean i i had deals come to me I, we haven't done any multifamily for for a while because it just was freaking me out, honestly. Uh, but, you know, we were seeing deals where you, your money went hard before you could even do your due diligence Yeah. At, over the last year. I mean, I, that, that just didn't make sense to me. It wasn't worth taking that risk, especially when you've got investor money that you're dealing with. And I just heard of somebody that you and I both know really well, I'm sure. And they walked away from a million dollars on a deal because they couldn't make it work after the earnest money went hard. And um, the 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 debt markets changed. I just talked to somebody today who's walking away from three. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's there's definitely repricing happening. Do you think that means there's opportunity or not quite yet? I, I think there's going to be opportunity. Um, you know, like I said, I got sent a couple deals today, and one of them, one of them, the broker was like, "Hey, you know, we can probably do this deal where you were looking at it." You know, like I I, I looked at this deal. 60 days ago, we said, Hey, it doesn't work for 11, you know, unless it's 11 million and somebody bought it for like 13. Now they walked on it. It's back on the market. He said, you can do this for 11. And I said, yeah, but the debt market's changed. I don't know that 11 works now. Right. Cause now I'm, I'm a, you know, 150 basis points higher on my debt than I was before. That's going to eat my cash flow. So, you know, I, I again, it, it, it's, I think we have to walk cautiously. I talked to my underwriter or my analyst today and, um, you know, we had this conversation. I said, we're going to have to underwrite, you know, a bunch of deals to find something and it might take us a couple of months, but, you know, we need to. But that's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Rather be safe than sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I love what you said earlier is slow down. There's no need to go to, to build so fast. I'm not sure why. I'm seeing that with syndicators who just, you know, they, they'll buy a seventies building that needs a deep value add. And then a couple months later buy another. And to me, that's a lot of work. You know, if you're, if you're fairly new to the business, you, that's two really large undertakings, let alone, you know, another few five or 10 or whatever they're doing. It does make me a little nervous that people are just jumping in. Why, why do you, why do you think we do that as humans? Well, I think it's, I think it's, um, uh, you know, that success thing, right. That we want. And we want to say, Hey, look what we got done in, in this short period of time. And, you know, Hey, I, I talked to somebody, they bought 800 units last year and, you know, 
they're having trouble stabilizing them. That was mm-hmm. my issue, right? I bought 4,000 units in 30 months. I thought I had a great team behind me. I had 100 people working for me. You know, I had a great team behind me, so I thought. But nobody was following the business plan. Nobody was stabilizing the properties. And I, I think you have to get these properties stabilized, especially going into the environment that we're going into. Um, get your CapEx underway. Get your CapEx a percentage done. Um, get your unit turns moving. So I want to go back to the question you asked a minute ago. Do I just think it's in multifamily or you asked about single family? I think single family is going to get hurt. But I think every asset class right now just needs to pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, you know, the true definition of a recession, right, is two losses, two quarter losses back to back in the in the um, GDP. And um, we've had that. Right. So. The feds are meeting at the end of the month. They haven't publicly called it a recession yet, but everybody's hinting around that it is. And I think that when the feds meet at the end of the month that, you know, they're, they're going to call this a recession. The media is going to pick up on that. They're going to be like a dog with a bone in their mouth. And, you know, before we're into this thing, probably for the next three years. Yeah, you know, um, they're starting to change the definition of that because it's very rare to be in a recession when there's so many job openings, you know, when there's just a, a row, but that, and retail sales so strong. So it, it'll be interesting. They might redefine recession after this because it's such a strange market that we're in. Uh, but I'm wondering if you were to go back to 2008 when everything was falling apart, what could you have done differently that I think, you know, some people need to hear today because they might be facing it soon? Yeah, I would have uh, cut my staff back quicker. Um, I would have let a lot of people go. Um, I would have spent more time, and, and we did do this in a couple of cases. Uh, I would have spent more time with the lenders and the servicers uh, trying to restructure my loans. Um, you know, I had interest rate, you know, and w- I had interest rate reductions done on some of my loans back then, but my loans at that time were 7%. You know, where do you go from a two or a 3% loan mm. that number that you have today, you know, um, it, it doesn't, you know, I don't know where you go. So I would have reshuffled the deck though a lot, uh, spent more time with the lenders, um, would have put a core team together to really focus on individual assets that were challenging. And, um, you know, I thought I had people that were, were doing that, but it wasn't happening. And so, um, matter of fact, in 2009, I went, I went to my partner at the time and I said, look, here's what we need to do. And I, I had come back after um, Christmas in 2008. And uh, so just prior to to Christmas in 2008, I closed a deal. I brought about 2.8 million in capital into the company. So we had gone full cycle on a deal and, you know, brought a a boatload of capital in. And um, uh, after, you know, we said, hey, let's not do anything with this. Let's just leave it sit. We got two weeks of holidays here. Let's go through Christmas and New Year's. Over Christmas and uh, break, I, I wrote a business plan, like nine points. And, you know, I went and met with my partner and our director of finance. And um, I laid this plan out and they were like, no way, we're not going to do any of that. You'll close another deal this year uh, like that. We'll cycle another deal. I said, are, are you are, are you crazy? Do you not see what's happening in the news and, and people didn't see it, but I, I saw it and I felt it. And, um, you know, it, it just got to be too late, too quick. And in order to, again, stay out of jail, do you think just telling investors that you were challenged would have been a better way to go than, um, uh, I, I guess, what, what do you call it? What, what did they get you on? What, what was the violation? What, it's wire fraud and mail fraud, but and it's a very okay. vast, it's a very vast. It's, it's like commingling, right? Commingling funds. No, you actually yes. could go to jail for wiring your electric bill to the, or your oh. electric payment to the electric company. Oh, 
yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so it wasn't so much about the the commingling. No, it it, okay. it wasn't because because that's not illegal. What was illegal was I didn't tell my investors. So for non disclosure, okay. right? Non disclosure. Okay. So I would tell everybody today: be very transparent. Be in a lot of communication with your investors. Let them know, hey, we have a market correction going on. Um, this is what's happening at the property. Be very transparent about occupancies. Be very transparent about cash flow. Um, make sure that reports are, are dated and up to date and that investors are getting them, especially if they're asking for something. You know, we, you know, and, the, and then here's what happens, right? You get to a place where you haven't done that. And if you, if you do it when the market is good and you build that habit, you're going to do it when the market turns and is bad, mm -hmm. regardless of the situation. But I was at a point where I, I hated to be the guy to give bad news. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to go to my investors and say, hey, listen, the market has shifted. Things are bad. We're, we're struggling. Um, and, you know, here's another silly thing that I did. Um, because the market was growing so fast, when we put our offering documents together, we took that provision out of our offering documents that said, hey, if there's ever a problem, we have the right to go back to our investors and do a cash call. And mm -hmm. I took a cash call out of my documents. So I didn't mm -hmm. have the ability to go to my investors. So now I didn't want to go to them and tell them, hey, you know, the market's bad. We made a mistake. We need capital. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we're going to run this thing. But yeah, it got mm -hmm. ugly. So Yeah, uh, absolute transparency. I, sometimes on I'll do uh, updates on mm -hmm. a zoom call so that people can ask questions and they can, you know, I can have the whole team there and it's full transparency. And I'll even have my attorney there to make sure that, you know, that he's monitoring it, you know, uh, because it is, it, it is just so important. And, and then as far as negotiating with the banks, that, that is, if, if banks see you going into a, a slow market, they don't want to get stuck either. And oftentimes we'll lower the debt amount that, we were able to negotiate that on one of our multifamily. Yeah, um, still was a very difficult deal that <laughs> lost money. It was it was uh, lots of issues with that. But um, yeah, you can you can negotiate with banks. They don't they don't want to be stuck with the property generally. Yeah, it's funny when you walk into a bank with a bag of keys and they tell you no, we're not going to negotiate. And you set a bag of keys on the desk in front of the vice president of the bank, and he goes, "What's this?" And you go, "It's the keys to your new new real piece of real estate." <laughs> And they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. What That's exactly doing? what I did. Oh, no. I did. I was like, here you go. You can have it. And I told the <laughs> investors I was going to do that. Here's here's the key. And they were like, no, no, no. We'll we'll lower the lower this by a million dollars. Oh, so good. Well, we're out of time. What what are any last comments for our listeners here who are just probably so intrigued by your story? Yeah. Um, you know what? Just be cautious in what you do today. Walk slowly. You know, like I said earlier, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you'll get there. It just may take a little bit longer now. And take your mm -hmm. time. Make sure you're you're balancing assets. Make sure you're being extremely transparent with your investors. Um, you know, we, we have a quarterly investor call coming up next week with our investors. And I, I, I believe it really becomes important. And, you know, if a quarterly call is not enough and you need to do you know, every month or every two months, then go to that. But make sure that you're being transparent and staying in front of people. Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll have all your information and your your educational webinars and boot camps all on our show notes. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for being transparent with us. Thanks, Kathy. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You can go to realwealthshow.com to get more information on how to succeed in real estate. It's free to join and free to get access to hundreds of webinars that will help you on your journey. That's realwealthshow.com. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.